certainly one of the most influential forces on rangelands is is fire wildland fire there's many different ways to look at how grazing interacts with fire today we're going to talk mostly about grazing and fuels uh, so this is karen launchball at the university of idaho the integrated rangeland management class this a chart is one that Dr. Ava Strand and I developed to um, emphasize that grazing has only can only influence a few characteristics that actually in the end will influence fire spread severity and intensity. So weather and landscape features are very important, but there are several fuel characteristics that grazing could influence. And among those are the live dead ratio of the biomass composition, fuel amount and fuel continuity. Don't forget that wildland fires are getting more and more abundant, but they're changing. So if you look at this graph, this is data from the National Interagency Fire Center. You see the number of fires have decreased since 1980, but the and that's the blue bars, but the size of those fires has, has radically increased. Uh, from the, from 80 to what it is now we've seen some really big flat fires and some really bad fire years so one of the challenges with wildland fire is uh, is to find ways to make those fires smaller so fire is a natural part of of all range ecosystems and especially the sagebrush steppe but uh, finding ways to limit the size of fires is very important we know we're having larger fires but but why what, what has changed that has created this much larger fires over the last 30 years. One thing that a lot of people say to me is that one of the things that could be driving these fires is that we have way less grazing than we had historically. So just in general, the amount of permitted animal unit months of forage that were taken off of federal lands in the 1900s was probably about 35 million, and now it's about half of that in the 2000s. Now, this was a paper from 2013 that has some of the better numbers available for changes in uh, in permitted grazing and at least on the BLM you'll see that the permitted grazing went from say about 16 million AUMs to something around 9 or 10 in 2010. A Forest Service has stayed a little bit more stable throughout that time but no matter what numbers you get you'll see that on federal lands quite a decrease in grazing since the 40s or 50s uh, when the BLM became established. So yes, less forage is being removed by livestock so therefore maybe more of this forage uh, this herbaceous biomass, which is forage, is also fuel, and there could be more fuel out on the range. But there's a lot of other things happening out on the range. Other historic patterns, such as the introduction of annual grasses, especially throughout the Great Basin. Now, this isn't true across all of the West, but in the Great Basin, there was an introduction of uh, cheatgrass, medusa head, red brome. In the late 1800s, these plants became dominant or started to dominate areas in the 50s. And the challenge with these annual grasses is that they're very fine textured and very flammable. And also they're early maturing, so they extend the fire year because the fire year starts earlier when you get grasses like this uh, cheat grass that's in this picture. It's starting to mature much more quickly than the rest of the range, so the fire year has already started earlier in the year. It um, is also very flammable, so um, it increases ignition risk along roads, etc. And overall, it decreases the fire return interval. So in a situation where we might have in the past had fires that returned every 30 to 50 years, now we have fires that return every 3 to 10 years in some places if they're really heavily dominated by cheatgrass. So a lot of things have changed. Yes, livestock numbers have decreased, and that could be one reason we're having increased size of fires, but also there's been more human development. There's more human caused fires than there were historically. The cheatgrass and annual grasses have ex um, increased, especially since about the 1950s, as I mentioned. And then climate change is playing into this too, where we have hotter, drier summers. So the fire season is, is getting longer. So where does grazing fit in? Uh, grazing certainly is a part of the sagebrush ecosystem. I am gonna focus on sagebrush step. For this example, it's probably true in, well, it is true in many other ecosystems, any herbaceous ecosystem, but let's focus on the sagebrush step. Grazing could have an effect on the fire and fuels. It also has an effect on those invasive plants. We'll cover those invasive annuals in another presentation, but let's take a look first at those fuels. Mm -hmm. What role does grazing play in the fire fuels? Well, here's an example. Here, this this picture is from the Murphy Complex. It was a very large half million acre fire uh, south of Twin Falls and in that Twin Falls area. What happened here in this picture is the fire was uh, moving along from left to right and it hit a fence and it stopped. And it stopped because once it got on the other side of the fence, that was an area that had been grazed. So there was a little bit less fuel 
than on the right side. Now that was the Murphy complex was a very intense fire that that uh, burned extensively, but there were places even in that very hot dry fire where we saw situations like this where a fire came along and it stopped at a at a fence line. So we do know that grazing can influence fire behavior. It can affect the perimeter or the extent of the fire. It could decrease the intensity or the heat of the fire. We don't know this uh, we don't have a lot of data on this, but the early data shows that um, you know grazing does decrease the intensity of that fire, the heat. Uh, it could increase the patchiness of the fire. We do know now that it does affect the flame length. So I'm going to show you information on all of these attributes. Let's start first with patchiness. This is a picture taken by Mike Pellant. And uh, he, it's a pretty good example. On the left-hand side, there was an ungrazed, unburned area where the fire severity was really high because it's very black. So it was a it was a sagebrush steppe area with a lot of herbaceous biomass. And when the fire came through, uh, it, it burned down to the ground and, and it became very black. And then that yellow line is the a line between the ungrazed sagebrush and the ungrazed seeding. And the seeding in this case was a, a perennial wheatgrass. Oh, intermediate or crested, I'm not sure which, but a perennial wheatgrass. You can even see this, the lines of where that grass was um, was uh, planted. And then the fire kept moving to the right in this photo and it hit a fence line. So that big straight line down the, third, the, the right third of the photo is a fence line. And when the fire hit that fence line, it started just figure, uh, fingering out into the grazed seeded area. So there really was no difference between the left and right hand side of that fence except that on the right hand side it was grazed and what you see is the fire just fingering out and um and and creating a more patchy situation so this is just a real visual example of how grazing might influence the fuel and create a more patchy fire we can uh, see some effects uh that that grazing might have uh with fire models so some of you may have used uh, fire models like behave plus i'm not an expert with these fire models uh, the, these models were run by Dr. Steve Bunting and uh, in situations or in parameters that were similar to the Murphy complex. So he simulated grazing effects on fire behavior and he incrementally reduced the herbaceous fuel load so he could see if grazing might have an effect uh, when he kept other environmental factors constant. So here's a few results that have some uh, take home messages. One is that uh, when you run these fuel models at pretty low dry fuel moisture, so 10%, that's pretty low. It can get lower, but that would be pretty low dry fuel uh, for this sagebrush step model in BEHAVE. And what you see is that part where I circled, that's where um, there's no effect. I mean, after 200 pounds per acre, the fire is driven by the wind. So those each of those lined is 5, 10, 15, and greater than 15 mile per hour wind speeds. And you see that the um, there's there's no decrease in the um, in the flame the fire line intensity or the surface rate of speed after you get to about 200. Okay, that's a problem because uh, let's just say that uh, in the sagebrush step, um, 600 pounds per acre would be a pretty normal production of herbaceous fuels, and you'd have to get the fuel down to well less than 200 pounds per acre to start having grazing have an effect on fires. Okay, so that is a really heavy level that most of us would say is not sustainable. That's at 12% fuel moisture. What if you increase the fuel moisture to just, I'm sorry, from 10% to 12%? Well, it's a little different story then. At 12%, you can see that there's an inflection point somewhere between four and 600 pounds per acre. So if the ecosystem normally has about 600 pounds per acre of biomass, we could easily get um, the biomass down to 400 and then really reduce the, fly, fly, uh, the fire line intensity and the surface rate of spread. Of course, these are just examples and models, but they give us a hope that um, grazing could have an influence, but, but um, not in really dry situations. So 12% uh, was a very different situation than 10% fuel moisture in this situation. When grazing is talked about as having an effect on fire, um, we usually would just think about the grazing that happened earlier that year, but Dr. Bunting looked with this behave models again to see if grazing in the previous year had an influence. So we used a 10, a 12% dry fuel moisture model. And if on the left, he had no carryover from the previous year. So as if the pasture had not been grazed. And you'll see that by the time the pasture is it gets above 400 pounds per acre there's a there's a radical increase in the rate of spread and the fire line intensity
the right hand model, he um, created a situation where the carryover of fuels was reduced by 50% as if the pasture had been grazed or 50% of the biomass had been removed in the previous year. And what you see here is that there, there is a really low fire line intensity and rate of spread up till about 600 pounds per acre. So maybe those numbers aren't quite perfect because these models have some uh, imperfections and they're, they're not really well informed by the uh, natural systems. But uh, it does show that there was an effect um, that maybe the previous year's uh, grazing uh, could have an influence even in subsequent fire years. And this was seen several times in the Murphy Complex fire where a, uh, a fire was going along at pretty high fuel moistures and cool temperatures and it would hit a, a fence and it would uh, peter out or, or stop even if the pasture had been grazed the previous year. So what about cheatgrass burning? I mentioned that there's been an increase in annual grasses and this is a really uh, you can see that fire just zipping across this cheatgrass situation so can uh, can grazing have an influence in cheatgrass there's one good study that was done on this it was done by a, a group of professors in the Great Basin and uh, what you're seeing here is if the fire was coming from left to right they had um, square blocks that were paired and uh, one was grazed and burned and one that was not grazed and burned and so then the graze and burn was the gray bar. And what you see is as the fire was moving and 10 meters before it got to the perimeter of the grazed or not grazed area, the, the uh, fire uh, flame length was the same. And right when it hit the perimeter at zero, the flame length was the same. Five meters into the treatment, the grazed and burned plots had radically reduced flame length, whereas the non-grazed and burns remained high all the way up into 55 meters into the plot. And... Uh, Whereas the grazed areas, the um, the flame length went down. In some cases, they were not even able to maintain the fire through the plots, but well, 55 meters into the plots. Uh, okay, I will admit these were very heavily grazed pastures, up to 80% utilization, but the utilization was taken in the fall, and these were not wildfire situations, but um, they were uh, prescribed fire. But uh, whether th this is possible all the time, we know that... Uh, Cheatgrass is a, is a really good fuel. Still, this study shows that even with cheatgrass, grazing could have an influence. We've been doing some research, uh, Dr. Ava Strand and I, with a student named Chris Schackschneider. And Chris did a really great study down in the Oahis where he had two plots, one with Wyoming big sagebrush and one with mountain big sagebrush. And the Wyoming had quite a bit more uh, sagebrush cover and the mountain had lower uh, cover and he was just looking to see if he could use targeted grazing to reduce uh, flame length and spread in these situations and what he found uh, this is just one graph that's coming out of some uh, some data that is just being analyzed now but what he finds is that what is really important is you can reduce flame height with grazing but only when you get to the left hand side of this graph when you get shrub cover under about 20 percent or uh, not certainly not more than about 20 some percent uh, when you'll see that the the flame height is no difference with the no graze low utilization or moderate utilization but um, on the left hand side less than 20 percent we see lower flame height with the low utilization and moderate utilization uh, points so grazing seems to be influential if fire was less than 20 percent sagebrush cover so where does grazing fit in we know it uh, it can reduce fuel loads. The other question we have, though, is what about continuity? We know that continuity of fuels is very important to maintain fires and sagebrush, and that's one reason that cheatgrass and annual grasses are so problematic, because one thing they do is they increase the continuity, the amount of fuel from plant to plant. There is not much data on this, but one thing uh, we do know that is that grazing does um, increase the gaps between plants. So this was a study done by Kirk Davies, and if you just look at um, an area that was uh, grazed and then a gray, an area that was not grazed, these were exclosures, what you see is the grazed area had slightly larger gaps than the not grazed area. In other words, there was more distance between uh, grasses or between plants in grazed areas than not grazed areas. Uh, there was also uh, a little bit more perennial grass in the not grazed area, and that includes the, the, not only this, the grass, but also the standing litter from the previous year. So uh, the question is, does this influence fire? We don't actually know the answer to that continuity 
and how it might influence fire? We're getting the answers. Uh, Dr. Davies and others are doing more work, but some things we do know. What do we know? We know that grazing can reduce fuel loads. It can slow and in some cases stop fires. It can reduce flame length. Several studies have shown that. Grazing can also affect fuel even if it occurred the year before the fire. However, grazing cannot stop fires if it's really dry and really windy. That the, this idea of trying to reduce the size of these mega fires we're having, a, a lot of that's out of our control because the situation is often one where there's it's really dry fuel moisture and it's it's really windy. So in those situations, grazing is not the key. Um, but if it's used really strategically, it might be able to be used in uh, fire breaks and really um, in strategic combination with other green strips, etc. Those are all ideas about how we might uh, um, manage fuels with livestock. Think a little bit about what a fuel management plan might look like. Uh, we talked earlier about um, what a weed management plan. It actually has sort of those same elements. One is think really clearly about how you might prevent fires. So how could you reduce the likelihood of human caused fires on a landscape? Think about corridors throughout a landscape. Uh, look at, especially along roads, are there ways that we could reduce human caused fires? We don't have much hope of reducing uh, lightning strikes. Uh, and once, if there's some fuel there and lightning strikes occur in the right time, usually a, you know, a fire will start. So our, um, our goal then is to find ways to compartmentalize fire, find ways to keep those fires small. So in your land management, think about what could you do with green strips or fire breaks or control pr practices to try to just give yourself a shot to keep the, the fires smaller and, and patchier. And then finally, um, fire in the West is not going to be won or, or conquered without co coordination and collaboration. So work with fire professionals and your neighbors because fire is another one of those things that doesn't care if there's a fence there or or, um, or, or what it doesn't get it doesn't stop at property boundaries. A real highlight or key to success in Idaho and Oregon are the rangeland fire protection associations and these are um, hitting other states also. These are situations where um, farmers and ranchers become qualified um, and they, they, they meet all the minimum training and they have all of the safety equipment to actually fight the fire. Uh, generally what they do is they're that first attack, they're on the ground so they really try to attack the fire when it's still fairly small and then when the fire professionals show up there's a transfer or at least a, a fighting side by side. In the past oftentimes the ranchers were told to go home when the fire professionals showed up. So now we're finding a situation where these folks are really working together and it's, it's a real um, opportunity for success, these rangeland fire protection associations. As individuals, I think ranchers and, and land managers can become aware and trained. There's a lot of things that we can do to uh, just be aware of signs, be aware when we are in really high um, fire risks. Uh, situations and then become trained. Uh, maybe not for the full-on firefighting, but there's certainly uh, ways to make sure that we, we know how fire behaves enough to get equipment out there, have that equipment ready, and become sort of fire aware. Those are just a few ideas about how we might start dealing with fire on rangelands. I'm not a fire professional, so these are just my ideas from a grazing standpoint. I'd love to hear if people have others. Um, go ahead and log into our website. Uh, rangelandmanagement.wordpress.com or send me an email range at uidaho.edu. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks.